Dennis Corpry here, and welcome to Bible Blessings Ministries. Well, we finally come to the end of the book of Galatians, and I've enjoyed going through it myself and studying it verse by verse and passage by passage. And today we're in chapter 6, and I'd like to cover with you verses 11 to 18. And here we have Paul's closing remarks, very important remarks, and it's amazing how Paul can put so many important ideas in so few words. And then at the end, he gives his final blessing. So if you'd like to look at some of the other messages that I've put out on this wonderful epistle, I'll leave a link for you in the description below. And if you'd like to continue on with me as we move into other books of the Bible, studying them verse by verse, please subscribe now to Bible Blessings and hit the notification button. I have several ideas. I'm not just exactly sure where I'm going to go. Um, I'd like to do the book of Revelations at some time, uh, First and Second Thessalonians, and I'd also like to do a, a series on the rapture. So I have a lot of topics and book studies that I'd like to get into. So once again, please subscribe now to Bible Blessings and hit the notification button. Now, as we come to our study today, beginning at verse 11 and down to verse 18, Paul begins here in verse 11 by stressing that he had written this epistle with his own hand. He says, see what large letters I have written to you with my own hand. Now, Paul here, I believe, is stressing his apostolic authority as he comes to the close of this important epistle. He had engaged in the debate with the false teachers and the legalists and the Judaizers. And he had engaged the Christians in Galatia, telling them that if they were to be circumcised, then the gospel or Christ would profit them nothing, that they would be fallen from grace. And he encouraged them to get back on track, to remember their early and good beginning and to resume on that track and on that path that the apostle had first set them on. So here he says, see how large a letter I have written unto you. Now some think that Paul wrote these last few verses in very large, bold letters, but I really don't see how they come to that conclusion. Maybe they have more information than I have. I don't know. But I take it to say that I, Paul the apostle, I'm not a false teacher. I wasn't taught the things I'm teaching by other men or by other apostles, but I have this doctrine by direct revelation of Jesus Christ. So I think it's a metaphor. He's saying, I have written in large letters with my own hand. And he's encouraging them to pay attention, to read this letter carefully, to take heed as to what he is saying. And then he gets into the controversy again in verse 12, and he says, as many as desire to make a good showing in the flesh, these would compel you to be circumcised, only that they may uh, not suffer persecution for the cross of Christ. And here in these few verses, he gets into their motivation. And I think that this is a very important lesson for us. What is it that really motivates false teachers. There's many false teachers today. There was many false teachers in the time of the Apostle Paul. So there's a lesson here as to examine what motivates. And Paul says that they want to make a fair or a good showing in the flesh. And that's really the first motivation. People want to gain prominence. They want to gain prestige. Speaking in our own terms, in our own day, they want to have a big following. They want to have a big budget. They want to make their name big and their ministry big. And in order to do that, they often have to compromise. And Paul gets into that in the next verse. Only, verse 12, at the end of verse 12, he says, only that they may not suffer persecution for the cross of Christ. If we preach the truth, will be persecuted. And Jesus taught his disciples that important truth in the Upper Room Discourse in John chapter 15, verses 18 to 21. And let me read 
the words of Jesus to you. He says, if the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. So Jesus was teaching his disciples, those who were following him, that they should expect not the applause, not the acclaim, not privileges and prominence in the world, but just as he was hated, he told his disciples, you will be hated also. So if the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love his own. Don't expect the world to love you. Don't expect the world to applaud you. Don't expect a large following. It's possible that it might happen, but very unlikely. Yet, because you are not of the world, I chose you out of the world. Therefore, the world hates you. And that's our comfort and consolation. He has chosen us. Even though the world hates us, we've been called out of the world. And you know, that's really what the word in the New Testament, church, means. It means to be called out. Ecclesia. To be called out. So we must remember that we're not at home in this world. And in 1 John, John the Apostle tells us, Love not the world, neither the things in the world. For all that is in the world is the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life. And these things are not of the, of the Father, but they are of the world. So we're not here to make a fair show in the flesh as Christians. We're not like the false teachers whose motive is to avoid persecution, but we are willing to bear our cross in order to honor the Lord who we love and serve. And that was the apostles' point here in revealing their motives. They were motivated by pride. They wanted to avoid persecution. And then in verse 13, he goes a little further. He says, for not even those who are circumcised keep the law, but they desire you to be circumcised that they may boast in your flesh. Once again, that idea of boasting or glorying in their large following. So they want them to be circumcised so they can glory or boast in their flesh. And Paul points out that these false teachers are hypocrites. They want you to keep the law but they themselves do not keep the law. And that reminds us of the Pharisees too in the days of Jesus. They wanted to sit in the most prominent seats in the synagogue. They wanted the positions of prominence in public display. They wore garments to attract attention to themselves and they were applauded by the public as being righteous, and they looked down and despised others. So that's the way these false teachers were here in the days of Paul when he was teaching the Galatians. They were of the same spirit as the Pharisees. They were hypocrites. What they taught, they themselves did not practice. So Paul here is telling the Galatian Christians to avoid such hypocrites. And that's the case in our day also. False teachers are marked by hypocrisy. They don't really want to follow the very things that they teach. Do as I say, but they have no intention themselves as doing as they say. So we must avoid hypocrisy and avoid false teachers who are marked by hypocrisy. And then Paul gives his own motives in verse 14. He says, But God forbid that I should boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. And this is the true spirit of the gospel, the true spirit of a believer, the true mindset of a Christian. And that reminds us of Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, that Paul said there, or wrote there. He said, For by grace you have been saved through faith, not by the law, not by circumcision, not by keeping the Sabbath, not by the works of the law, or keeping the law of Moses. No, you've been saved by grace. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And not, not, that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. 
So that's the way God has designed it. There's nothing for us to boast in when we think about our salvation. We come to Christ unworthy. Nothing in my hand I bring, only to the cross I cling. There's no merit in ourselves. All our works or all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. And we cannot make ourselves righteous before God. But by simple faith in the Lamb of God who died for our sins on the cross, Christ's righteousness is imputed to us. His blood washes away all our sins. And we are right with God. We are justified positionally. And the law of Moses has no more sentence of death or no more claim upon us. We're set free, we're at liberty, and we walk in grace. So we don't boast, we have nothing to boast about. And Paul says that of himself, that was his motivation. He says, but God forbid that I should boast. In other words, if I boast in my own works, I'm sinning, God forbid that. Except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul knew that without the price that was paid, without the redemption that God had ordained through the blood of Jesus Christ, Paul would be hopeless and all of us would be hopeless. So there's nothing to boast of in ourselves. And people today really do want to boast. Oh, I keep the Sabbath. Oh, I uh, attend church regularly. Oh, I'm a good person. Oh, I help the poor. Oh, I do this and oh, I do that. And many of these things are not bad in and of themselves. But if we think that way, we forget that all have sinned and all have fallen short of the glory of God. And we forget that without a Redeemer, without a Savior, without a blood sacrifice, our sins can never be atoned for. And God is holy. And without that blood, unholy and sinful men and women such as you and I are could never be saved, could never come into the presence of God. But we would be condemned without the blood of Christ and cast out from the presence of God and rejected and cast down into the place called hell to suffer torment there forever and ever. So we boast in the cross. We boast in the gospel of Jesus Christ and not in ourselves, such as these false teachers did. And Paul says of Jesus Christ, going on in verse 14, he says, by whom the world has been crucified to me and I unto, the, and I unto this world. So this reminds us of the words of Jesus again. And Jesus said this in John 17, 14, in his high priestly prayer. He said, I have given them your word. He's praying and speaking to the Father. I have given them, the Father, your word. And the world has hated them because they are not of the world, just as not, I am not of this world. So we're not of the world. We've been born a second time, John chapter 3, we've been born again, we've been born from above, we've been born of the Spirit, we've been washed in the blood, we've been sanctified by the gospel, we've been made right with God by faith in his Son, Jesus Christ, and we are not of this world. We're crucified with Christ, and our destiny is wrapped up in Christ. We died with him. And we were raised again with him, he being the first fruits, and we are the following fruits. And his gift to us, I'm glad to announce to you, is everlasting life. And even though we're hated in the world, we're rejected in the world, our home is not in this world, we have a message that the world dislikes and has always persecuted and despised, yet we will never die. The world can do its worst to us, but there is nothing, the Bible assures us, that will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. So we glory in the cross. We're glad to be crucified with Christ. 
We're not of this world, but we have a home in heaven that Jesus has gone to prepare for us. And that's in John 14, one to four, and he will come again and receive us unto himself. So Paul says, the world has been crucified to me and I unto the world in verse 15. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything but a new creature. Now they were caught up with these false teachers who were telling them that they must be circumcised. Paul says that doesn't matter a thing. That's not important. What's important is, is that you trust in Christ as your savior, that you're born again, and that you're now a new creature in Christ. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. We have a new principle of life, the Holy Spirit dwelling in us, and old things pass away, and all things become new. Now that's a gradual process, and I hear a lot of chatter on Facebook and other social media from Christians who think that once they become a born-again Christian, and once they are made a new creature in Christ, they'll never sin again. And they expect sinless perfection in the Christian life. And as they go on, they become sadly disappointed. When they fall into sin and temptation, they start to think, well, I must have lost my salvation or I must have never been saved at all. And they get very confused and tangled up. But. When the Bible says that we become new creatures in Christ, it's a gradual process. It begins with a new attitude, a humble attitude. We begin to love God as we had never loved him before. We begin to appreciate the cross and the blood of Christ such as we never have before. And we begin to live in a new manner of life. It's not a straight line up. It's more of a jagged curve. Up, we have our ups and downs, but gradually we're making progress and all things become new. So, uh, sanctification is progressive. We progress in it. So that should be our goal in the Christian life, to make progress. And we will never be perfect, I'm sorry to tell you, until the day we meet Christ in the air. And then this corruptible will put on incorruptible. So circumcision doesn't mean anything. What matters is the cross. Have you believed in Jesus Christ? Have you looked to the cross? Have you been covered in the blood of Jesus? And have you believed in the Son of God, Jesus Christ, as your Lord and Savior? And I'll remind you, don't trust in baptism. You're not saved by baptism. You may have been baptized as an infant. You may have been baptized in a denomination. That doesn't save you. The blood, the cross is what saves you. Christ and believing in him is the only way. Some people think, well, I've been a church member all my life. I belong to this denomination or I belong to that denomination or I've done this ritual, or I've done that ritual. Forget about all of that. It does not profit you anything, just like circumcision. Paul told the Galatians it profits nothing. Look to the cross, trust the Son, receive the Son and believe in Him, and you will be saved. Whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And that's what makes a new creature. Now we come to the final few verses here, Paul's blessing and plea for them. And after explaining the importance of the cross, the prominence of the cross, the exclusivity of the cross, and the importance of being made a new creature in Christ, being born from above, Paul says, as many as walk according to this rule, not the rules of Moses, not the law of Moses, not the works of the law, not any traditions handed down from men, but as many as walk by the rule of faith, the rule of the cross, the rule of grace, and the rule of the gospel, the peace and mercy of God will be upon them and upon the Israel of God. 
So we walk by this rule. We walk by faith. We walk in the Spirit. And those who do so will have peace with God. They will have fellowship with God. And they can look forward to everlasting life. They can endure whatever trials and tribulations they may face in this world. And they will never perish. Now this little phrase at the end of verse 16 has caused a lot of controversy. It says, and upon the Israel of God. He says, as many as walk according to this rule, peace and mercy be upon them and upon the Israel of God. Now, Paul is speaking here, not of the church when he says the Israel of God. He's not uh, hinting to the idea or stating the idea that the blessings of Israel have now been transferred to the church. No, God has a distinct plan for Israel, which has a future fulfillment. Israel is spoken of in the Old Testament. You won't find the church there. And all the promises that God gave to Israel will have a literal fulfillment in the millennial kingdom. Jesus Christ will reign from Jerusalem a thousand years and Israel will be uh, restored according to all of God's promises to Abraham, to David, and to the prophets. So when Paul here is speaking to the Israel of God, I take it that he's speaking to those Jewish Christians who were sort of wavering back and forth. They were being influenced by these false teachers that they must keep the law of Moses but Paul comes out very decisively on that issue and tells them that they are no longer under the law. And if they decide that they would continue under the law, then they would be fallen from grace. So Paul here distinguishes between the church and Israel. He gives his blessing to those who walk according to this rule, whether they be Jews or whether they be Gentiles. And upon the Israel of God, those who were the Jewish remnant, and many of them were Christians. And then he goes on to say, from now on, let no man trouble me. Paul is tired of this controversy. He stated his case. He's put it, he's put it down in writing. It has the seal and authority of his apostleship. So he's saying, I have put it down in paper. You can read it and study it. And I don't want to be troubled anymore on this matter. He says, for I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus Christ. Do these Judaizers want to boast in their circumcision? Well, Paul says, even though I'm circumcised, I won't glory in that. I will glory in this, that I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, I have stood for Christ and I have suffered for Christ. I've been abused and persecuted for the cause of Christ, and that is what I will glory in. For I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you want to boast and claim covenant relationship with God through your circumcision, you false teachers? Well, I'm not going on that ground. I'm going to glory in the cross. Christ suffered for me, Paul says, and now I am following him and I have suffered with him. And therefore, Paul was assured that he would also be rewarded richly for following Jesus Christ faithfully. And now Paul closes out this epistle with these words, brethren. And this is a reminder again that even though these Galatians had not followed the Lord faithfully, they had gone astray, they had swerved off the course, but Paul assures them that they are still brothers in Christ and he's working to restore them. So he says, brethren, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit, amen. Even though Paul had been very combative in this epistle, very fiery, very straightforward, abrasive, yet he closes with a blessing, giving them the assurance that they could confess their sin, be reconciled to fellowship with God, and continue on in the Christian life according to the grace and truth 
of our Lord Jesus Christ. So that really finishes up our study in the book of Galatians. So this is Dennis Corkery, and I thank you for joining me today, and may God bless and be with you.